Oh. <laughs> Good afternoon, and thanks for being here. We're just waiting for just a couple of seconds for, uh, for our panelists to get here. One is from another session, and uh, the other one is uh, from online. But if we have any, um, any of our panelists online, maybe we could also project their uh, presence here on the monitor so we can feel their presence. Dolly, can you translate that for me? Can you tell them where the online audience can, the online uh, speakers can be also projected? Here. Yeah. Hi, Johannes, we can see you. And hi, Caroline. Thank you for joining. We're just waiting for one more minute to, for, for hopefully for Onalena to join us from Botswana. We are, um, we are chasing her. <laughs> Can you see us, Johannes? And uh, yes, good. Well, I think uh, we're going to start um, and then keep our fingers crossed that on a, Lena and, uh, of course, Rachel will join us uh, momentarily. Rachel is just opening, doing opening remarks in another session, and then if you see a lovely woman running to this session, you know that's Rachel, our speaker. So, I'm, again, hello to, uh, to you, everyone here, and welcome to this session, which we have named as Preparing for the Next Pandemic, Applying a System-Wide Approach to Health Data, which is co-hosted by Open Data Watch and WHO, World Health Organization, and Paris 21, which by now everybody knows it stands for Partnership in Statistics for Development in 21st Century. And thank you for joining us and being in the room and for those of you who are joining us online. My name is Shada Badi and I'm the Managing Director of Open Data Watch and I'll be moderating your, uh, the session for, for today. And before we, we dive in, I just wanted to say a few words on why we are here today and why this session is so important in the context of what we are talking about at the World Data Forum. We can all remember this time three years ago, the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic was in its infancy, in fact, as countries closed their borders, the hospitals filled, um, airports closed, and uncertainty grew around the virus itself, we, we saw an unprecedented need for data and growth and appetite for data and impact of data and decision-making and policies. Three years later, and the need for timely quality and comprehensive health data, I think, cannot be more critical at the time that we are. We all feel for data, but one category of data that I think we all actually very much associate with is health data because it touches us all as individuals, as families, as communities, and of course, you know, as. Uh, um, as providers of information and data. So without a better understanding of who is uh, impacted, how health systems are responding, and where there, is, there are gaps, policymakers, of course, cannot make evidence-informed policies and responses to recovery and rebuilding all the weaknesses in uh, uh, rebuilding, basically. Weaknesses in any one element of the health data ecosystem reduces the completeness of the data that policymakers can act on. 
and access to policy to timely, reliable, and disaggregated data and comparable health data therefore depends not just on one element of the data ecosystem, but on the capacity and coordination across multiple sectors to collect, analyze, use data for public good. Additionally, to ensure that health data are used for the public good, it's imperative that this is open and accessible to all citizens at every stage of the data journey. This openness is critical in building trust with users and ensuring that data are used and impactful. In some ways, I was trying to describe the, how, what we mean by the system-wide approach. So this session explores how adopting a system-wide approach can strengthen national data systems at all levels. It will consider some of the challenges and opportunities to operationalize a system-wide approach to health data and outline some of the good practices for better health data governance. And that's why we have such a great um, set of speakers from different organizations bringing all these different perspectives. We will first begin, and I'm really excited with uh, announcing that, with a short scene-setting presentation reflecting on the health data lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic and the key opportunities for improvement before we move to a panel discussion on need for a system-wide approach for health data management and some of the country examples. And then we'll come to you with discussions with audience. So please be engaged and have questions for us or comments or some of your perspectives. And then we'll move to a wrap up um, segment of this uh, session. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you uh, Steve, who's doing to give us a scene setting presentation. I think m many of you who are here know Steve. He's Sig McFeely is <clears throat> Director of Data and Analytics at the World Health Organization, who will provide us with a scene setting. So let me uh, join me to welcome uh, Steve to the podium. Thank you, Shaida. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my great pleasure to, to set the scene. Um, before I start, a special welcome to Babatunde, who's not paying attention, but he's, he should be at his own session, so it's great that he's here. Okay, so in the first two years of the COVID-19 pandemic, member states reported that five and a half million people died. And tragic as this was, it was almost certainly an underestimate. At WHO, we estimate for the same two years when we add in indirect effects as well as direct effects, which what we call excess mortality, the, the death toll was closer to 15 million people. Since then, in 2002, an additional 1.5 million people have been reported dead, and we're working on the excess mortality at the moment, but we're probably approaching 20 million people. So what lessons did we learn, or perhaps more appropriately, what lessons should we have learned or should we be learning uh, from this pandemic? So what follows is a, a very much a personal view. Um, so you know it's going to be good because this does not reflect uh, the WHO position. So lesson one. So I have seven lessons. Lesson one. We need to exchange data and information. We saw at the beginning of the pandemic um, information wasn't exchanged quickly enough, and that, that, that had a, a deleterious effect. But we also saw during the pandemic, South Africa, when they had a new variant, did share data very responsibly, and we also saw what happened. So I think we, lesson one for me is that we need to make sure that we create a safe environment where we don't punish countries for sharing information and data. We need to make sure that we do not create disincentives um, because if we do, we only slow development, um, and that's, that's in nobody's benefit. Lesson two, data aren't enough. Early in the pandemic, despite the, the data gaps that existed, there was almost suf certainly sufficient data to inform uh, good decisions. But it's clear in many cases that, that decisions ignored these data. Why was that? I, I, I don't know. Was it an inability to analyze the data that were available? 
uh, was it ideological positions that prevented the, the objective use of data? It's not clear, but what is clear is that data alone aren't sufficient. We need to make sure that there's literacy and that there's a, a, a will to use the information that are there. Lesson three, data delayed or data denied. From a statistical perspective, the UN is not well organized to deal with emergencies. The need to agree every estimate with member states uh, makes sense uh, from a data sovereignty point of view, makes sense in the routine or normal conditions. But under the circumstances of crisis, this really inhibits our ability to move quickly. It retards rapid and flexible action. So during the pandemic, we saw several non-governmental institutions very quickly publishing COVID-19 estimates, whereas WHO was working slowly to agree estimates with member states to get permission from member states to publish estimates. And I would argue this was to nobody's benefit. Um, so more recently, we've seen in the case of excess mortality, which WHO was producing in cooperation with UNICEF and with DESA, a very, very, very small number of states, I'd even go so far as to say one state, basically retarded publication by over six months. It, this is crazy. I mean, it, it really is, um, it, it's a problem. So we need to find a better way. We need to find a balance where we consult with member states, but at the same time, we provide timely information that support crises. Lesson number four, never waste a good crisis. After the Great Depression, after World War II, that led directly to the development of gross national product and the system of national accounts. Governments at the time, realizing they were blind, um, couldn't intervene in economies. The development of gross national product was directly supported the, the FDR New Deal and also the, the reconstruction of Europe. I don't get the same sense post COVID-19 um, that governments are demanding better data. I think as the statistical community, we're demanding better data, but I don't get the same sense of urgency. And it's not clear to me why that is. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary in this day and age that 40% of all deaths globally still go unregistered. Um, death is one of the defining bookends of our lives. And yet for many, that, that, that moment goes unmarked, it goes unregistered. Uh, and this has implications for economies, for human rights, for migration, for gender rights, and of course for statistics. So on this, I won't labor the point, but I would encourage everybody to read our World Bank blog, CRVS. It's not just important, it's a matter of life and death, which nine or 10 different UN agencies contributed to. Lesson five, avoid simplistic solutions. There will be more pandemics, there will be other crises, but each one will be different. So we need to be careful about promoting dashboards as the, the simple um, solution, the basis of our defense strategies. They may inadvertently blinker us, and rather than prepare us, that they may give us a false sense of security. So I think what we really need to be doing is focusing on developing analytical capacity statistical literacy, and I would argue perhaps trying to cultivate a mild sense of paranoia that all of the time we're looking at the data with curiosity um, and, and looking for signs of change. And then lesson six, we need to develop national statistical systems and in parallel support the development of national data infrastructure. This means using good international classifications, unique identifiers, digitizing information, from a health perspective, I think we need to move away from the idea of health information systems and start looking at a broader lens where we de-silo health, look at a more holistic perspective and start looking at the idea of information systems for health, which links health data um, to both outcomes and determinants, which could be anything from education to tax data. This is challenging, but I think it's really important that we de-silo health. And lesson seven, we must learn the first six lessons. Thank you.
So lesson seven is to learn the first uh, le uh, six lessons. So that's really, really good. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And re um, you know, you, this is excellent. And you should really write that as a paper or a blog um, as a result of this session. So thank you very much. Now, we, let's move to our panel discussions. And um, as part of the panel discussions, of course, Steve, you're going to be coming in again. And of course, we have uh, Johannes with us as well, who are now officially part of the panel. <laughs> And it's not only for closing remarks. Everybody's waving at you, Johannes. And I'm really delighted to have Una Lena with us. Dr. Una Lena, we're really glad to have you with us. Dr. Una Lena is a CTO uh, Kogo Way, which I'm sure I mispronounced, uh, is the Deputy Permanent Secretary uh, for Monitoring, Evaluation, and Quality Assurance of the Ministry of Health and Wellness of Botswana. Really welcome you. And then we also have Caroline Gatwiri Mutwiri, who is the statistician of Kenya Bureau of National Statistics, and she is also joining us virtually. I'm really glad to see Caroline. She is a very good colleague and a very good friend. R lovely to see you. And, also, and in the room, we have our lovely Rachel Bevan that everyone knows. She's the director of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific. And really glad to have you. And of course, last but not least, we have Johannes Juding, who's the executive director of Paris 21 with us. So let's start our, our, um, our uh, um, discussions with you uh, on a little first. The question that I have for you is, we just heard from Steve, and I hope you heard him, about some of the global data lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. I wanted to know, uh, now turn to you and sort of see from your perspective at the Ministry of Health uh, in Botswana, <clears throat> In, what, what does the ministry, how, what role can the ministry play <clears throat> in implementing a system-wide approach to health data management? Over to you. She needs to be unmuted. You need to be unmuted. Just one second. Try again, not yet. The third time is a charm. Yes, we are unmuting her, but her voice didn't <clears throat> go into the conference. Can you say that again? Uh, we are unmuting her on the conference, on the online conference, but his voice, her voice didn't come. I can't hear her. What'd she say? Can you try to unmute yourself? I think she needs to open her access to microphone. Oh, now increase the volume. <clears throat> no, we cannot hear her. Yeah, we can see the picture, but yeah, we cannot hear her whole voice. Maybe she needs to open her access to microphone. Hmm? Open her access. Yeah, maybe oh. we can move to the next speaker and let's try. I cannot hear you, sorry. <clears throat> we can move to the next yes. speaker. Yeah. And I'm going to move the, uh, um, if, <clears throat> if you allow me, Anna Lena, I'm going to move to uh, Caroline and ask her that question. Meanwhile, we try to uh, test your computers to see whether you can open access to your microphone, if you could. <clears throat> so, so Caroline, I'm turning to you now. <clears throat> um, the question that I have for you is that, of course, the Ministry of Health aren't alone in this, um, trying to make a system-wide approach. <clears throat> and they must work closely with counterparts at national statistical offices. So given your role at KMBS, at the K Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, how can NSO collaborate with ministries to collect, analyze, and use inclusive health data? Over to you, Caroline. I hope we can hear you. 
Um, I hope as well. So, uh, hello everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us from. So um, I'll just jump right into the discussions because of time and I hope I'm audible enough. So um, the role of NSOs in integrating a system-wide approach you know, for health data is typically you know, based uh, through its mandate. And as KNBS, we have the Statistics Act of 2006 that has spells out clearly what are we supposed to do as an NSO. And I want to believe, you know, our mandate cuts across, you know, uh, basically all the NSOs. So um, first and foremost, as a national statistical office, uh, we're the principal agency for the government in production, uh, dissemination uh, of official statistics. And in addition to that, you're also supposed to ensure that standards, uh, you know, and use of best practices and methods are you know are taken into consideration as we produce and disseminate these statistics uh, across the national statistical system mm -hmm. but most importantly it's 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 our role as a national statistical office to plan authorize uh, coordinate as well as supervise all official statistical programs undertaken within the national statistical system and for this particular subject you know it's not different they're supposed to ensure that all that is, is taken into consideration uh, as an NSO. So um, I want to just reiterate the fact that, you know, a system wide approach for health data is very critical and uh, it requires a formal sort of engagement that is led by the government uh, through mechanism for dialogue and uh, coordinating, uh, coordination, sorry, across the national statistical system. And we need to take into consideration the account, into consideration that, uh, uh, different stakeholders, you know, their interdependencies, as well as how they interact uh, between each other. So there are several ways in which, you know, the NSOs can actually collaborate with the ministries, uh, departments, agencies, uh, for us to be able to help one another in terms of collecting, analyzing, and having an inclusive health data uh, system. Uh, first and foremost is um, the element of developing uh, collaboration and coordination frameworks, which essentially are meant to create an enabling environment where the stakeholders be able to work together. Uh, an example of a very good you know, framework that's geared towards this is the National Strategy uh, for Development of Statistics. Uh, in our case, we have the KSDS uh, that is typically running from 2019, 2020 to 2020-2023. So this sort of a framework is, 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 is geared towards helping NSOs and the stakeholders as well in planning and uh, you know, for, the, for the countries de to develop capacity to produce, uh, disseminate and mainstream you know, the use of statistics. And um, in line to the NSDSs, you know, the SSP, the Sector Statistics Plan, these are very core because uh, for this particular uh, subject, a Sector Statistics Plan for Health is, is very critical, which would basically just offer strategic direction for the entire health sector uh, during a particular period. Another example of a very good framework that would guide in, in, in the collaborations and uh, collection and you know, use of uh, health statistics would be the quality assurance frameworks. Uh, at KNBS, we've developed the case curve, you know, that is supposed to provide guidance in ensuring the quality of data produced within the national statistical system, you know, is, is, is entrenched. So, and then um, we all agree that NSOs cannot purely address all the gender gaps, oh, sorry, all the data gaps. Sorry, I'm from the gender statistics. So, so all the data gaps. So um, they also need, uh, there's need for a guideline to also uh, try and, uh, you know, address uh, extra data produced within the NSS by the CSOs. So we've also developed a CGD guideline that would enable us um, guide the CSOs on how they can assist us in filling the data. And, and the health data is also part uh, of, of this sort of um, arrangement. So um, another way to ensure um, this is uh, done in order is um, actively engaging the ministries, uh, the departments, the agencies in the data production and dissemination process that is uh, done by the NSOs. 
Um, case example, uh, currently, as we are doing the 2022 Kenya Demographic and Health Survey, we're in the process of launching the main report. So successful implementation of, of surveys is, is strongly rely, uh, relied, um, reliant on how you collaborate, how you engage the stakeholders. So, and, and different surveys, they have different stakeholders, different key stakeholders. Uh, for the DHS, uh, since it has a very strong health connotation and demographic connotation, Ministry of Health and other health partners uh, are strongly involved in that. And we've seen a lot of success in how we do that. Even as we go forward towards the post enumeration uh, processes, the dissemination communication ETC. So um, I'll just make a mention about um, open data policy. So that is a very critical because you want everyone to be able to access your data. You want everyone to be able to use the statistics. Uh, so we practice that a lot. We have an open door policy uh, as well, where we also ready to offer any technical support to the ministry's department and the agency when they're carrying out these statistical activities. And this is uh, to a large extent as well, the civil society organization. So this ensures that the quality aspects are taken into consideration as they also carry out their statistical activities by having that sort of you know, communication between us uh, and them. So um, there's also the element of having the technical working committees, you know, and uh, the interagency committees, uh, particularly for KNBS, we have the Health Statistics Technical Working Committee. Uh, for this um, sort of a session, we have other committees as well that enable the engagements uh, between the data producers and the data users and us as an NSO to be able to understand what's happening and to be able to ensure that uh, we produce quality and timely statistics as well. Um, user producer dialogues or forums, you know, another way to really engage and collaborate with the ministries, departments and agencies to be able to understand, are we meeting the needs for the users, you know, uh, are we or are we just producing statistics for the sake of producing statistics? You know, uh, very key as well. Um, passing the information to the public as well. You know, uh, dissemination of official statistics is very key as well. So we need to ensure that NSOs are are disseminating the official statistics as well uh, for everyone to be able to use. And beyond the dissemination, are we communicating with the statistics? Do we have uh, communication strategies as, 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 as NSOs as well that will be able to target different audiences and use different channels uh, for us to be able to ensure that what we do is used for policy and programming ETC. So uh, lastly, this, is, this doesn't come as easy as it seems. There are a lot of challenges in, in doing this. And, and, and for health sector is the complexities in the health uh, delivery space, which has different players. Caroline, we have to cut it. We have to go, we're okay. running out of time, sweetie. Thanks. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the whole data value chain and the, that we need collaboration from planning at the NSTS, collaboration all the way to data collection and dissemination. But we, we, we really need to move on. Thank you so much for that intervention, Caroline. I'm going to go back and try my luck with <clears throat> Una Lena. Onalena, can you speak and see whether we can hear you? Good morning. <clears throat> oh, bravo. Can you hear that's, me? That's fantastic. So, yeah, okay. go, you, you heard my question. So can you answer that question? Please, please repeat it. <clears throat> can you please repeat the question? Yeah, we can hear you and see you well. And uh, if you okay. can increase the volume, it's even better. But we can hear you. OK. All right, can you repeat the question for me again? <clears throat> Please come in. Yes, um, go ahead and speak. Can you speak, okay. give us a brief uh, remark on, uh, from your perspective at the Ministry of Health and Wellness in Botswana, what is the role of your ministry in ensuring that there is a system-wide approach to health data okay. management? Okay, thank you very much and good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, the ministry, as we all know, has the overall, overall responsibility for health. It provides a, an oversight in all health issues. So the most important thing is that the ministry has to acknowledge that it is the custodian of health data. Although this health data is all over the place, it is in the private sector, it is in the non-state sectors, it is in the national statistical uh, uh, agencies. So the most important thing is that there's need to build strategic alliances 
so that you are able to collaborate in issues of data. The ministry has to provide guidance in terms of the standards and uh, maybe even looking at the tools that are going to be used in the collection of data. So that is very, very important. At the earliest uh, time, the ministry has to make sure that it understands its stakeholders. So that is what we did to look, especially during the pandemic, to say who is where collecting what data and how can this data actually support us in making strategic directions to address uh, the pandemic as it is. So effective engagement and advocacy is also another very critical thing that we need to do as a ministry to make sure that we are all on the same page. Fortunately for the Minister of Health in Botswana, just before the pandemic hit, uh, we had developed what we called Botswana Health Data Collaborative uh, Roadmap. This is where we have brought all the stakeholders that are dealing with data or have interest in data, as well as the partners to come together and work on this issue of making data accessible as well as looking at the investment to say what kind of investment can we make in the area of data management. So that has been very, very helpful. We have very uh, several technical working groups within the Health Data Collaborative that work together to make sure that the data is, is, is available to all. And uh, the other very important thing that we are doing or that we did as a country was that we, are, we were in a form of a transformation where we are trying to digitalize uh, our data management. So the ministry was providing the leadership in actually coming up with the systems that will collect data and make it uh, available on real time. And the, the partners were supporting by bringing in the technology uh, that is uh, available to make sure that even the remotest areas, they have access to, uh, to data. So that is what we, we were able to do. So another key thing, because uh, a lot of times you find institutions or organizations, uh, they have their own kind of systems. We worked a lot on making the, the systems interoperable so that we can be able to access uh, information from other systems, from other agencies. So I would say that is basically what we, as a, as a ministry, did to make sure that we have got a system-wide kind of approach. We really engaged a lot with the private sector because a lot of time that, that is where the challenges are, where you find yourself reporting on public health data, not necessarily national data. So we worked very closely with the private sector this time to make sure that um, we get data from 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 all aspects of the country. So uh, I think I will I will stop at that uh, and uh, respond to any questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Anella. Very important point. Really appreciate uh, hearing from you and your perspective and experience from the Ministry of Health and the approach that you are um, you are taking. My next question will be an excited about the discussions with Rachel because of the position she has and where they sit, an, an important uh, position, I must say. Rachel, we know that we can't talk about health data system without acknowledging the important role those administrative data systems play, like CRVS, in understanding the impact of disease. So on SCAP side, I, you really prioritize supporting countries to build CRVS. Can you tell us more about how countries can integrate CRVS systems in their health data management practices. Over to you. One more time. Can you hear me now? Okay, we do. Great. Thank you so much. And it's great to be part of this panel. So within UNSCOUT, we're obviously one of the UN regional commissions, which means we really work in three different ways. One is advocacy, the second is around providing technical support, and the third area is around knowledge sharing. So let me say a bit more about that. So the work that we do in terms of advocacy, we can bring member states together. So back in 2014, we brought 
member states and governments <coughs> across uh, Asia and Pacific together. And it was there that they actually agreed that the period from 2015 to 2024 would be our CRVS decade. So at a very high level, we got ministers to actually agree on a shared vision that all people in Asia and the Pacific will benefit from universal and responsive CRVS systems, facilitating the realization of their rights and supporting good governance, health, and development. So it's really important actually to work at that very top level to get that engagement and to get ministers to actually agree on, on that overall aim. But then we also have been working on a framework to actually talk about, you know, what does that actually mean in practice? So there are three particular areas that we're working on. One is to help countries uh, to have universal registration of births, deaths, and other vital events. The second, though, is also to make sure that all individuals actually have that legal documentation as well. So it's not just enough that births and deaths are registered, but also the individual needs that information so that it supports them when they want to go and, say, access healthcare or go to school even. And then the third area that we work on as well is uh, it's not enough that the information sits in the CRVS system, it needs to be used. So it's important that actually countries also produce vital statistics, so actually produce information from those systems that can then actually be used by policymakers, and particularly on things like causes of death. So back in 2021, uh, just when I'd started this job, actually, we did a mid-decade assessment to look at what was actually happening across Asia and Pacific. And at that point, the mid-decade assessment showed that actually there were still 64, over 64 million children who were unregistered across Asia and Pacific. But if we actually think about that number, I mean, it's almost, it's kind of the population of my home country, the UK. That's a whole country's kind of population. It's just not being counted. They're not being registered. Um, we have seen, and that's even after we've seen some big improvements, and actually countries are making, you know, great improvements in that area. But the area on, on death registration, <clears throat> we're seeing a much more mixed picture and progress is much, much slower. And there are countries within the region like Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, where less than 25% of deaths are even registered. Um, and, you know, that's even being registered. That's not even getting to understanding the causes of death. But we know that one of the things that we are seeing is that countries are beginning to integrate CRVS systems with health data systems, and that is really helping. And we're seeing lots of cases where actually countries are putting in place systems so that when a child is born in a health facility, then the mother can go and register the baby immediately. So they're not having to go and do it at a separate location at another time. So they're making it easier and easier to actually do that. And that definitely is making a difference. But we do know as well, though, that for data sharing and for that kind of si these systems to actually work really well, we need to share that data as well between CRBS systems and the health data systems. But that requires a lot more work. <coughs> so it's areas of things like needing to work on data privacy and making sure that actually the right mechanisms and legal frameworks and policies are in place and that there is effective communication as well. I think we're seeing as well that, you know, countries have very different practices on this. And that's because, um, you know, countries are set up very differently. And it's important we kind of build on what's there already. Um, and it's not going to be a kind of one size fits all. We see examples where in the Philippines, their civil registration system is part of the statistical authority. But that's perhaps unusual. Um, and that perhaps helps them on one area, but, but we see, you know, other countries where they have different setups, and so they're going to need to kind of collaborate and coordinate in different ways. But I think one area where there is really huge potential to move is probably in the area of digital health management information systems. So as information is being captured, to actually make <coughs> sure it is being captured um, with the right kind of classifiers, the right definitions, so that then we can reuse that information. Uh, for different purposes uh, across government, but making sure that privacy is always maintained. 
But I would say, you know, just one more thing really that coordination is essential. This is about people working together. It's about understanding different parts of government, different needs. It's about people really working together on these issues. It's not one part of government that can do this. It's not government on its own that can do this. We really need to work across um, a whole different range of stakeholders and work together on these issues. And it's only really then that we can continue to make progress. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel, and thanks for your work and ESCAP's work on CRVS. Really important foundational system for health, but for other uh, in information systems for the, the data ecosystem. So really appreciate that. So I'm, I'm turning around now from country perspective. We've heard from um, on Elena and from uh, Caroline, uh, from the regional perspective, we heard from, um, from Rachel. I'm gonna go back to Steve again to hear one more thing uh, from him on the, at the global level. And the question for you that I have, Steve, is uh, given WHO's country work, what are some of the good practices that facilitate a system-wide approach to health data systems? Thanks. So I, I think, in a way, Rachel has actually answered that question. I, I think it's it's really about... You can't get away from answering. <laughs> okay, well, I tried. <laughs> it's, well, first of all, it's thinking about it as a system. Uh, and I think that's the approach we have to... We have to step back and think of it as a system. So what does that require? In a lot of cases, it requires legislation um, put in place. It requires good governance to be put in place. It requires coordination. So. If you take something like CRVS as an example, which is only one example, but it's an incredibly <coughs> complex one, there's a lot, of, a lot of different departments of skin in the game, a lot of different parts of government. So they all need to be at the table. Um, they all need to contribute. They all need to contribute resources, time. They need to contribute the will. If we're talking about sharing data, we need to put in place the mechanisms that allow data to be shared. So it needs to be digitized, first of all. It's very hard to move analog data. Um, secondly, then you need to, if it's gonna be shareable in a usable way, we need to put in place unique identifiers. We need to put in place standard classifications. And that then brings you straight back to governance because once you start talking about sharing data, it's not, it's not always clear that you can do that safely. It's not always clear that you can do that <coughs> legally. So you're into the circle where you need to make sure you've put in, in, in place the pieces that allow you to achieve um, the system. And then I think that the, the other piece is you really need to sit back and think about it from an architectural point of view. You don't, well, very rarely do you just build a house you sit back and you design, you know, what is it you want? Why do you want it? Like, why do you want a bathroom here? Why do you want the kitchen there? D data deserves the same kind of respect. Um, you, you don't just put gas systems in place in the country. You don't, you don't put a refinery there at, kind of at random, put pipes there at random. You sit back and you design, well, okay, the ships come in there. It needs to be unloaded. We need to move the gas to the, to the retail, to the houses. It's done with the design in mind. We need, to do, we need to think about data that way. So who's producing the data? Who's gonna clean it? Where is it gonna be stored? How is it gonna be stored? And how is it gonna be transmitted to the different people who are using it? So I think we really need to start thinking about talking about systems and then data using words like infrastructure and architecture and really thinking carefully about design. Thanks, thanks Steve. Um, and glad to hear all those elements that you mentioned. And it looks like, you know, this interlinkages and, you know, user-centric model and everything is, adds to that complexity that you're talking about and that you have to really uh, look at it as modular. Um, so thanks for answering those questions. We, um, we're now going to turn to you. Um, if you have any questions from this, is an amazing opportunity. You never see this group together. And, and then we'll move to Johannes, who is going to be, you know, bringing all this together. He has a very simple task of organizing and bringing all this together and do the closing for us. But uh, over to you for any questions that you may have. Not all at once. Yes, we have three questions, four. 
Um, well, let's take uh, uh, these questions and then I'll come back to the, uh, to the panel. So can we pass the microphones to, to, our, uh, to our audience? There's one here, one here, and there are two over there. Colleague from Brazil and then colleague from Washington, D.C. <laughs> Please introduce yourself too. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Peiling Yap for the, from the International Digital Health and AI Speak Research higher. Collaborative. Higher. Love. Yeah. Okay, so um, thanks a lot for this intriguing discussion. Um, I certainly agree with this system-wide approach uh, to prepare for the next pandemic. But when I think of systems, I think we shouldn't be thinking of just health systems. Um, we have to bring in the agriculture system, the climate system, so we'll appreciate your thoughts on how you're breaking those silos and how you're creating that wider information system to bridge across these different systems. Thank you. That's a great, <clears throat> great question. And we did mean by, by system-wide approach that's beyond health so that we can have interlinkages with other systems. Please. Uh, my name is Gerard. Uh, our PhD student and my area of interest is algorithmic management and augmented intelligence. Uh, I do have a question of if we are addressing issues to deal with the next pandemic, if there's something COVID-19 has taught us is the models that we have used in the past were ineffective. And in an emergency situation, we saw WHO and all governments trying to catch up and develop a model that will address uh, the, escalation, uh, the escalation of the pandemic. So, and in health uh, uh, sector, we are talking about data silos. Uh, so, what models do we need to design that is more proactive, that is recent? With the advancement of AI, smartphones, like I believe in all countries, people have smartphones. What, are we designing health correction or gathering data using the past model that, mo be, uh, that use predictive method based on past data, yet for future pandemic solution, we need more proactive, recent, like yesterday's model or last, uh, last week's data for us to articulate and solve, develop models that will solve the immediate problem as we are going. Because the approach that we are using in health data is in the past, in algorithmic management, we're having the same problem, whereby system are coming in, workers are being dethroned from those positions, even in the health sector. By the time you are thinking of solving that problem, is one, two years when it has caused havoc within the health sector. So what models do we go, and how do we debunk the serials that we have and use more proactive digital red models and systems? Another great question, and I think it was one of the lessons in, uh, in Steve's list, but we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, yes, please. Hello, I'm Alexandre Barbosa from CETIC at Brazilian Network Information Center. I'm really happy to be here, listen to all those ex experts, a very uh, important discussion. It's a paradox that uh, many healthcare establishments produce tons of big data. Uh, as our colleague has said, they're in silos. They are not integrated. And during the pandemic, but we still have data gaps, as was already said, especially for policymaking in the healthcare. And during the pandemics, we saw how information communication technologies were relevant in special uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, AI. But we do have an even bigger data gap in terms of ICT related statistics. So, um, in the past, our organization, working in cooperation with the UN ICLAC and uh, PAHO at WHO, the Pan American Health Organization, we designed a framework for ICT indicators in the health sector. And today we have in Latin America five countries producing regular and comparable data. So my question is, uh, what should be the role of WHO in set methodological frameworks for measuring the implications of digital technology in the healthcare so that we can really have uh, the policy design based on evidence? And when we see the, to the UN uh, family uh, organizations, we have ITU with uh, access for individuals, households, we have uh, UNICEF for ch killed, uh, uh, kids, UNESCO for education. So, in the, in the healthcare, what should be the role of designing and promoting 
in fostering the production of ICT-related statistics in the health sector. Thank you. Thank you. I know we sh who should answer that question. And last question here, we're running out of time, so can you sure. please make it short and question? Yeah, it's a quick one, yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Alice. I'm the project director for CHISU. Uh, just a quick uh, comment and question, and they're both for uh, Annalena from uh, Botswana. One is the congratulations on the HDC roadmap. I think it's really a groundbreaking piece of uh, governance that was, that was put together. But the question I had was, what were the mechanisms or incentives put into place to be able to get private sector data uh, and to get the, the, the private sector reporting into the health information system? Thank you. Was that for anybody specific? For, both for, for Anna Lena. For Anna Lena. Yes. Okay. So I'm, we're running out of time because I want to give a go good five minutes to Johannes for wrapping up. So we have, uh, we have four minutes, four speakers, one, one minute each going back to any of the questions that you want to answer or any final remarks that you want to um, us to walk away with. Over to you, uh, Steve. Okay, so I'll start. So I'm gonna take question one and three. I'd love to take question two, but I fear we'd end up in a very long discussion. <laughs> um, Thank you for not doing it. Have so tea together afterwards. And question one, I agree completely. And, and this is the point I was trying to make. I think we need to move away from thinking about health information systems, which I think effectively silos health and move it into information systems for health, which from, okay, it sounds like a subtle difference, but what I'm talking about here is linking health information systems to the other informational systems in the state. Or, or, or in the private sector for that matter. So it's really de-siloing health so that we can draw on understanding the determinants, but also outcomes. And, and that, that really comes back to my earlier remarks then about the infrastructure and the, the architectural design. So at the moment, I think health is very much trapped in its own little bubble. And, and for me, that's an issue. And in fact, that, that leads me to the question three then. On the ICT statistics for health, <coughs> I would, be, I, again, I, I'm kind of slightly adverse to siloing health because I, I think all the time our, our tendency is to say health is different, which it is, but it's not at the same time. I mean, it's, it's part of a wider ecosystem. So I, I'm very much of the view that we, we have the UN Statistical Commission, which is the authority for setting standards. So I think. Any, any normative standards we bring, we should bring to the Statistical Commission for international endorsement. And that's important too, because it also means that all of the other agencies and all of the other member states are involved. So then it's not just WHO promoting a particular view. We can be the normative developer of those standards, but it's very important to get the buy-in of the regions, of the other agencies like UNICEF, UNFPA, all of the people who are involved in these sectors and get their viewpoint as well, and then get them endorsed as international standards. That last piece is important because all of the time, it then protects the member states. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Godhart's law, the mm -hmm. idea that as, as soon as you adopt an indicator, um, it becomes useless because if, if you start using an indicator to change or to charge uh, or to chase a, a policy objective, people start gaming it. So th this is why international standards are really important, is that it gives the country the protection to maintain the standards so that the, the indicators aren't gamed. So that's a rather long explanation, but and Thanks, I'd, I'd love to come back to question two, but I think that would require an even longer intervention. Yeah, I think question two is really important, uh, but we'll, you, know, you need to have coffee with Steve. So we have uh, five minutes. So I'm going to come to an, 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 uh, you have one question, specific question for you. Can you answer that, which is sort of this incentives to get private sector data sharing going? Thank you very much. Uh, the, the, the main uh, incentive was that uh, the private sector was called upon during COVID-19 to provide COVID-19 uh, services, and they were paid for by government. So that means they had to report using the system that government wanted them to, to, to use. And therefore, it brought uh, the two sectors, the public and private, very closely together. And that is what we are currently riding on to say, yes, we provided you with DHIS2 
as a system to, to report? Can we continue using that system to report even beyond COVID-19? So that is how we, we manage to get the private sector. I also wanted to comment on the on, on the first question of uh, the, the silos and say in Botswana we are trying to one of our our strategies to is to work on one health so we are trying to bring in all the sectors the agricultural sector and many others that have something to do with health into you know bring them to table have a common plan and have a common monitoring and evaluation framework thank you thank you very much uh, over to you, uh, Caroline, very briefly, if you want to sort of make any closing remarks or a quick answer to any of the questions that, um, that you think you can answer. Uh, mine is a quick one and a very brief one. Um, basically, you know, we all need to think and consider a wide ecosystem uh, that typically just understands uh, these different stakeholders. Uh, you know, data about people's health is, is no longer confined to the medical records and uh, sort of uh, clinical trials, but um, the, the, there are many other sectors, as earlier spoken by previous speakers, that um, have uh, sort of a health indication. This includes housing, transport, agriculture, you know, and food. So we need to consider having a wider uh, sort of health data ecosystem for us to be able to understand and to bring everyone on board to have a comprehensive um, system that just speaks to health issues. Yes. Thank you, Caroline. And last but not least, uh, over to you, Rachel. Any last uh, closing remarks or any quick, quick questions? I know that many of those questions you can answer, particularly how to break silos. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I think in terms of, yeah, how to break silos, this is the kind of thing, the work needs to be done at the country level depending on the kind of country context. But I think also there's a real opportunity to learn from each other. We're not in this alone. And I think COVID really demonstrated that as well, that uh, it's not developed countries and certainly my own country, the UK, did not have perfect systems. So we're all in it together and we can definitely all learn from each other. And actually things like digital transformation and some of these new things and new tools actually will really help us in this. So that creates a real opportunity that we might not have had before. Thank Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rachel. And now um, uh, turning to Johannes. Johannes, uh, you have an easy task of very uh, quickly uh, wrapping up our session, this rich discussions, and telling us how we have done and what more we need to do. <laughs> Over to you, Johannes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shida. Good afternoon. Um, great pleasure to be with you, uh, unfortunately, only virtually. Um, well, I have three points to share with you from this uh, really quite interesting discussion. So um, from a Paris 21 perspective, this was, of course, music to our ears to hear that all panelists said we need to strengthen systems and we need to think beyond um, the importance of the health system and health data is ecosystem alone. I mean, this is what Paris 21 stands for at large. But so my first takeaway is um, it's really um, heartening to see that all panelists had this um, what Steve's and Steve's were the de-siloing of just looking at health data ecosystem alone, but looking at a broader information system. And I think we heard from Caroline and we heard from Botswana and we heard from Rachel, uh, different examples of how this could be done. So the first take, um, and uh, really a consensus here on the panel about this topic, which is great. Second point is um, what, what, what are the I think, Schroeder, you asked me um, the vision. What is the vision for an inclusive health data ecosystem or for uh, data ecosystem uh, here? And I think there are two pillars. Um, one is the classical ecosystem, and it has been de described by many of the panelists. I will not repeat in detail. We talked about the different actors from users to producers. We talked about governance. We talked about the need of exchange, stewardship, coordination. This is set. I think I would like to offer a, a second important pillar that hasn't been looked as, as it should be done by our community, and this is empowerment. I would say the ecosystem, we need a, a similar pillar focusing on empowerment. And if we would unpack empowerment, there are issues like, um, that has also been mentioned, um, data literacy, capacity, accountability, and trust. Now, let, let me make it just a bit more specific. Um, to, to make the case more clearer. 
So on the data literacy side, I think um, if you if you look back, I mean, the, the, it, it's to some extent it's it's um, it's 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 even irritating, right? I mean, the pandemic, as you said, Shida, was starting three years ago to become visible. Now, in many parts of our life, we already forgot about it. Um, people have moved on. There are other important crises now to deal with. But some of the lessons learned was also in the midst of the pandemic that we had all this data and there was no truth in the data. There was not one data point that was had the truth. For instance, in the lockdown, some countries applied the lockdown using certain thresholds of R values or incidence rate and other countries use other um, sort of uh, numbers. So what is the main takeaway here? The main takeaway is it's not just about the production. It's just about the use. It's about empowering people to make informed decisions and in particular empowering citizens. Some governments have made really arbitrarily decisions which were not backed up by any scientific evidence and they were just using data and to say, yeah, because of this threshold, we needed to lock down everything, which was really, uh, you could really criticize. So. As a society, if we want to support society, if we want to strengthen society, it's very important to, to stress more emphasis on empowering citizens, empowering this data literacy. I think that's, that's for me, a, a real uh, important point because it's, it's in some parts we have really lost trust. In some parts, uh, governments have lots, uh, lost a lot of trust because uh, sometimes even experts, which I think is quite normal if you work in, 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 in this field, that experts are not always on the same, or always have the same view. But for the ordinary layman, it was confusing. They were confused. Some professors said we have to do A, some professors say we have to do B, which in a normal uh, democratic society is just what often happens. But you need to have really this empowerment of people. I, I can just if you allow me, was just one little anecdote um, that I have witnessed myself, which for me is really the de uh, part of the health system. When I was a doctoral student, I went to Senegal. I, I did a lot of research for five years on health, in, um, health insurance system for the poor. In many poor countries, health is the main risk for poverty. If you fall, if your family falls into big health issue, it's a big, big problem. And also in China, we were studying uh, quite a lot of also the China experience in setting up insurance systems. It's a big, pro it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a really challenge. But understanding insurance and health insurance and health, healthcare financing is critical. But it also means that you have to go into insurance markets. You have to understand of how people relate to risk. You have to understand of how people's production system work. And this is all very different data system from a pure health perspective alone. So again, um, health is, and in particular, the mental health that has come up very recently uh, as, as a very, very important point, requires data from many other parts of society. And um, this interchangeable of, of using different data points is, is really critical. Now, let me come um, to my last point. Um, how can we get there to this uh, more integrated, inclusive information data ecosystem in health? Well, I mean, the first is, I, I'm still puzzled. I have to say, I'm still puzzled that we as a community, there isn't not enough really stepping back to learn from successes and failures. Where are the international comparative analysis of what worked and what didn't work? Where are the sort of funding from philanthropic organizations to look into um, these determinants of success. What did we learn from COVID? I think we have to go. We are too quickly have gone away to the next topic, which is now, there are no other topics that keeps us busy in this world. But where are the analytics? Where, where do we learn from all the things that we can observe? So a, a real plea, we need, to, we need to step back. I think there have been some things done, of course, but in many parts, not enough. Second is experimentation, innovation. Um, that's something, um, there are interesting examples being tested out in, in some countries of how to break those silo systems. And, and here, I think we, we really need to encourage those things. Uh, we, we need to uh, help countries that, that are ready to do so. Uh, and, and of course, Paris 21 and, and with all our partners, we stand ready to support. And then the last point is echoing uh, Rachel. Uh, I think um, in particular country level, country level, country level, learning from country level. Uh, it's, it's those things and we can talk about intellectually very excitingly, 
but uh, if you really want to do a change, you have to go to the country level. And let me even say to a city and local level, because many of the things, if the next pandemic comes, where we see the action is really at the local level. It's at the local level, cities, municipality level, where the, where the things are happening with over or crowded hospitals, with those kind of things. So more focus on local empowerment people and bringing both East together, ecosystem and empowerment. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Johannes, for really rich and uh, uh, important wrap up of this session. We learn, of course, from the discussions and also from your wrap up, the opportunities, but also the complexities of applying a system wide approach that we have lots of opportunities. But it looks like today we've touched the surface only. So there's a lot in it. But it's nice. The nice thing about it is that we have WHO we, through uh, Steve. We see that WHO is really committed to the system wide approach. I think it was really his vision, Steve's vision that some of us picked up this topic for today's uh, today's event. And of course, we have partners like uh, Rachel Escap, the country partners, Paris 21, and of course, you smart um, uh, stakeholders. So let, join me to thank this amazing group of people here come together. And of course, yourself. I hope you found it uh, useful and you promote it in, on Twitter, LinkedIn, for others to watch who are not here and can uh, also participate in this important discussion. Have a super rest of the day, and don't forget that we have a plenary in room one, and I'm gonna run there. <laughs> thank you again, bye. Johannes, thank you, and have a good evening. Bye-bye, huh? <laughs> all the best for you. Bye, nice to bye see Caroline, you. bye Anilera. Bye, thank bye you. everybody, bye Shada. <laughs> yeah.